Hey, welcome to the first ever, what are we calling this? I don't even know what we're calling this thing. To my left over here is Drew Ryan, uh, producer Drew. He's going to be looking at your comments. And what are we calling it? What? What's the thing called? You've got right a now it's Wednesday Night Live. Wednesday Night Live is what we're calling it right now. <laughs> this might change some. And uh, we just want to welcome you. It's a, this is an online Bible study. And by the way, I got my sling off and I can almost move my arm a little bit. I'm not supposed to move it at all. So don't be telling the doc. But uh, we're going to be doing this every week. We're going to give this a try. We used to do a Sunday on Wednesday worship gathering. Uh, but we wanted to do something for our online audience and invite people to be here. So on Sundays, we are inviting you to join us in our live worship. But what we're going to do on Wednesdays, we're going to flip this around. And we're going to invite people to be in here live while we're with you online. And so we've got some folks, if we could pan it around, we got some people in here, and you can see them, so y'all can virtually wave at them, all right? And uh, the plan is that we are going to go backwards in time to the sermon that was previously preached and dive a little deeper into the subject matter. And we want this to be interactive. So if you're online, ask your questions, put your comments in, and to my left is Producer Drew. Back Hi. there in the back, in the back is Producer Dan. There's something that sounds better about Producer Dan than Producer Drew. Well, I, you can just call me co-host. I don't co-host Drew. There yeah. we go. So co-host Drew, producer Dan. So uh, Drew uh, will be monitoring those questions, and he's going to interrupt me at, at, at times and feed me some of those questions. And then here inside of our building, anytime you guys got a question, just wave at me. You know, I'm going to look at the camera as much as I can, but I'm going to look at you guys, and and uh, we want to make sure you folks feel like you're in here and that we feel like we're over there with you. So. Uh, do, do me a favor real quick and share this to your page if you got it, all right? So if you're watching on YouTube, then maybe share it to something, however that works. And if you're watching on Facebook, either my page or Ventures page, then uh, take a second and share that over and, uh, invite, so people can come and invite us in. Hey, let's, let's begin with prayer, and then we're going we're gonna to dig into this. I'm really excited. So, Lord, thank you so much just to be able to sit down and, and study your word. And it's amazing getting to do this with people uh, from different places in the world that are joining us right here in big old Dallas, North Carolina. Uh, God, I ask that you'll just open our eyes and to your truth. Help us to understand your word deeper. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would not just help us understand it, but you would shape us with it. God, that you would actually change our hearts, grow our confidence in serving you and in today's subject. Lord, I pray that you would grow our marriages into an us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, you got to be careful when you say that phrase. You know, when I say we're going we're, we're gonna to try to become an us. <laughs> you got to be careful. All right. Uh, that can get really bad. You, you with me, Jason? Jason Kelly's doing this at me. All right. So, uh, so here, this, we just finished up a series. Ironically, I promise you, I'm not trying to fix Jonathan and Chris's sermons, all right? So the way this worked out was, Jonathan, uh, I was supposed to preach the first sermon in the series that we called Us to Becoming One about marriage, uh, but I had my shoulder operation. And uh, so Jonathan jumped in, grabbed my notes, made it his own sermon, literally had to do it in a matter of days, and did a phenomenal job of kicking the series off. And then, and then Chris bookended that this, this uh, previous weekend. If you didn't get to hear it, it's, uh, you can go to our Facebook page, website. And Chris Mintz talked about how we can become an us in marriage by serving together. So what I want to do is I kind of want to circle around where we started and where we ended. Again, I'm not, I see Jonathan in the background. I'm not doing this so I can fix his sermon. Um, but I just, I want to get back to those bookends as we wrap this up. And by the way, next week we begin a brand new series in the book of Matthew. We're going to go Matthew chapter 1 and 2 on Sundays. And so we'll be doing our follow-up in here on Wednesday night. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in Matthew 1 and 2 that there is no way that I have time to get into uh, with my 40-minute time frame uh, that I'm trying to get to 35. But, I mean, God parted the sea one time. So, uh, but my time frame on Sunday morning, uh, there's no way I'm going to get into it. So we're going to get into some of those subjects when we're live uh, on Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff. So uh, here's where we're going to begin today. Just as a quick review uh, to the series. Uh, the entire series was built off of the premise, you remember... Uh, Ephesians 5, where the Apostle Paul talks to us about marriage and how a husband should love his wife as Christ loves the church and how a wife should respond as the church is to respond to Christ. We're getting the image in Ephesians 5 of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just as the power and plan for us to know God, but the power and plan for us to experience 
oneness in marriage, an us. All right, everybody here with me say us. us. All right, so see, I told you, pretty with just people here, right? So uh, if you got your Bibles, we're going to be flipping around some. Uh, we're we're going to actually, we're going to kind of work from the left to the right in our Bible. So if you got your Bible, I want you to back up to Jeremiah chapter 31, all right? Uh, our entire concept of an us is built off of the new covenant in Christ being God's plan to create an us with him. Well, that new covenant was prophesied all over the Old Testament, but I want to point out specifically Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. So Jeremiah 31, I'll give you a second to get there. Jeremiah 31, verses 31, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. All right, now, I got my, uh, I left my good reading glasses at home and I got my computer glasses. So I feel like, one of those New York Italian guys that always has like the colored lens on the glasses, you know? So I got, I got my colored lenses. It's supposed to keep me from going blind looking at my computer. But I'm at the age now, I got to use glasses. All right, so when I, when I read my Bible. So uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Listen, listen to what the prophet said. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, that they couldn't do, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So see, again, we have this marital imagery there coming right out of it. God considered himself the husband and Israel the bride. And he wants to form a new covenant with them. And we understand the new covenant being not just those who are Jewish, but also Gentiles, us, who are not Jewish, being brought into the household of God. But we already see that imagery there, this marital imagery. So he goes on to verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So what do we got going on here? Well, we understand as we walk through the Genesis all the way to Malachi, we begin to understand that the Old Testament is pointing us to a greater thing, a greater king, a greater prophet, a greater covenant, a greater everything. Everything in the Old Testament is pointing us to something greater. Even a greater relationship with God's people that were once descendants of Abraham, but now come from every tribe and tongue. So every aspect of the Old Testament is pointing us to something greater. The Old Testament is not the point. The Old Testament is the pointer, all right? So if you're studying the Old Testament and you miss that, you're going to get it wrong, all right? So let me say it again. I I never really do alliteration real good. I, I got two Ps. Real preachers get three Ps, but I'm only good for two, all right? So uh, so the Old Testament is not the point. The Old Testament is the pointer, all right? So as you're reading your Old Testament, you need to be reading that with the understanding the mystery has been revealed. When Jesus Christ was born, died on a cross, rose from the grave, the mystery was revealed, the curtain was torn in the Holy of Holies, and all that the Old Testament was leading into was now fully presented, especially at the ascension of Christ and the dissension of the Holy Spirit onto the people in Pentecost, and we have the birth of the church, all right? So everything at that point, when the church is birthed and God reveals the Holy Spirit in his people, then all of a sudden, everything in the Old Testament is no longer a mystery. It's, it's now real. It's in front of us. It's a lie, all right? So, so the prophet Jeremiah is pointing to a day when this husband, wife, template concept of God and his people becomes something that is no longer king, just king and ruler, but actually one. Like, these are going to be my people. And they're going to know me. And they're not even going to, they're not going to need a, a earthly priest as a go-between. They're going to know me. They're going to fellowship. And we're going to be one. All right. So that was lost for centuries until Jesus was actually born. So if you got your Bible now, fast forward to John chapter 15. This is where Jonathan, uh, whenever I'm, you know, I'm not good with names. 
So I think one time I was trying to do John and Jonathan, and, and I was getting them all backwards, and it was a mess, because Jonathan's really biblical, but he's not John. All right, so, so John chapter 15, Jesus is teaching, and this comes right after John 14, where he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. All right, key verse in the scriptures, John 14, 6. We get to John 15, and he begins to give us a reference that, again, helps us understand our goal in marriage. So why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because the gospel is not just, is not just the template. All right, God, the gospel is not just the power. I'm, I'm, man, I'm rolling on these peas today. God, the gospel is not just the power and plan for us to know God, but it's the power, the way to do it, and the plan for us to be one with one another. So we need to look at the gospel to understand how that works. So John 15, verses 4 and 5 is where I want to sit on real quickly here. All right, John 15, verses 4 and 5. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. All right? So what was he getting at here? Well, he's talking about the new covenant. And what we said, I love, it was actually, I think, when we have our, our, uh, our meeting, I get together with some of the pastors, and we work through what I'm going to be preaching. And I believe it was, you know, I... I'm the one who wrote the first manuscript, just want to say that, but Jonathan made it a lot better. And his, he actually is the one that came up with this illustration. Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. So Jonathan actually came up with this illustration. I'm, I'm really sure it was him because he's from East Tennessee and he would think about this, all right, uh, about kudzu, all right? So I grew up in Hampton, Virginia, in the city in the hood. We have no kudzu in the hood, all right? We got bricks and, and concrete and stuff, you know? So kudzu, when I went off to college, I'm like, what is this vine growing on everything, all right? If you're listening from somewhere else in the world, uh, you don't even know how big of a plague kudzu is. You cannot kill this mess. Jason, Blake Harris, remember he tried to kill itself in the back of his house two years? Spent all this money trying to kill this kudzu. Two years later, it was all back, all right? So, so kudzu grows on top of shrubs and trees. It's a vine. It grows like a foot a day or something crazy, all right? And it will actually kill the tree. It will kill the bush, dead, all right? Jesus is talking about us being a vine, okay, that he's the vine and we're the branch. But you never look at a plant and go, there's a vine and there's a branch. You just look and say, there's a vine, there's a kudzu vine. You don't separate the kudzu out from the branch. Jesus is giving us an illustration to help us understand that we are one with him. He's describing a part of the vine, and we're a part of the vine. But at the end of the day, there's just a vine. There's Christ. And so the gospel has made us literally one with him. So in the Old Testament, you see a people that are laboring to serve God, that are working their rear ends off to try to obey the law. Well, some of them did anyway. When you read the Old Testament, most of them were not working their rear ends off to obey the law. As a matter of fact, they were rebelling most of the time. But nonetheless, you have in the Old Testament... This, this really God and them kind of relationship. But when we get to the New Testament, because of what Christ has accomplished on Calvary, it, the new covenant, it's no longer God and us. It's just us. Now that should blow your mind. That the one who spoke the world into creation, like he created all things, wants to literally be one with you in the way that we should want to be one with our spouse. All right? I mean, just ponder that for a moment. There's 7 billion people on the earth. That's a lot of people. And the guy who made all 7 billion of those people, the God who made them, literally wants to know you as close as a branch is merged into a vine so that it can produce fruit. Where you don't really know the difference between the one part of the vine when it was no longer a vine and it became the branch. But that's how God wants to know you. I mean, it's amazing how we just feel like God's off at a distance and doesn't care about us. And yet the new covenant that Christ died to create was to create that kind of relationship where we are literally brought into the body of Christ and made one with Him. I mean, that is amazing. Okay? Now, that is what the Bible tells us is our goal for marriage. Okay? That we're literally... I'm trying to pick my hand up. I'm, I'm picking my hand up. All right? I'm not raising it. I'm picking it. All right? So for those of you who are just joining us, I just had shoulder replacement. I'm probably supposed to have my sling on still, but I'm going crazy. 
All right, Noah. So the vi- like for your marriage, that it's not husband, wife, living life, but it's husband and wife are one, one entity, one, one person. All right, that's our goal. So many settle for that as not the reality. They settle for two people crisscrossing paths, living life together, coming in and out of a home. Uh, you end up with multiple kids. You take those kids, I'll take these kids, and let's just keep these kids from driving us crazy. I understand that. I have three of them. One of them is just like me. All right? So, uh, so I get that. But what happens is we begin to live our lives this direction, and we're not really becoming an us. And the whole point of marriage is to be an us. God's made us to want to be an us with him and he made us to want to be in us with others like you were built for that god did not make people to live on their own and the greatest us that you'll ever have is in marriage i mean i love my kids i love them huge i mean we can if you have children then then i don't really need to highlight that the love of your kids is you know you just can't really put words to it (laughs) but you understand the love of your kids is not a love of choice they're your kids. Like, you, you're just, there's something wrong with you if you don't love your kids. Now, we all get mad at them, but there's something wrong with you if you don't love them. You know what I mean? Because that's just the way God, I mean, a dog loves its kids. It's just, that's just the way God made the universe to work. Flowers maybe love the flowers they planted. I don't, I don't know. I remember I asked one. But, but, you, but you chose to love your spouse. All right, you weren't born with some symbiotic relationship with your spouse. Now, some of you are like, oh, yes, we were. No, you weren't, all right? You were not born that way. You made a choice to love your spouse. So it's easy to love your kid. But becoming one with your spouse takes effort, takes work. I meet people all the time like, man, we've been married. Especially in our church, we have a lot of young families. And maybe you're, maybe you're a young couple. And, you know, we live in this incredibly immature age where we think, you know, six months is a long time. Man, I mean, I've, been, I've, been, I've been on this job for six months. I think I'm just tired of it. You know? Man, you, I mean, like for real, it takes, I mean, that's just, anyway, I don't even have words for that, all right? But so <laughs> three, three years, the average divorce happens within the first three years of marriage. Like you can't even get a high school degree unless you're one of them like Jonathan Pugh's kids that are all smart. Unless you're one of his kids, you ain't getting no degree in three years. You know what I mean? Like it takes four years to get a high school degree. The most complicated thing in the world is not a high school degree. The most complicated thing in the world that will make the most brilliant nuclear scientist scratch his head is how to be one with a spouse. And you're going to try to figure that out in less than three years. I mean, like, serious. All right, so if you're at home right now and you've been married a year and a half going, I don't love my spouse anymore. I don't love my... All right, just stop. All right, there is no way that you have figured out how to be one with someone of the opposite sex in a year and a half. Carrie and I have been married. What year is this? This is... 2020, as if you couldn't remember yeah. that year. Yeah, 20. Yeah, I'm trying to forget 2020. Right? <laughs> well, like, if you're there. online, give us a, a, a raise your hand. You're trying to forget 2020, and can I get a holla, amen? All right. So, uh, we've been married since 1999, and we're still figuring this out. All right. And I'm not just saying that so I can be the humble preacher. All right. Like we're still figuring this out, man. I always tell men, if or women, if you married a man who understands you. You accidentally married a woman, all right? We don't understand women. We don't get you. Y'all don't make no sense to us, all right? And I think the feeling is probably mutual. I think Carrie often looks at me like this. Like, she can't figure it, all right? Just not understanding what's going on. So, so it takes a long time, and it takes a lot of effort. So that's what this series has been striving for. The, just think about what it took for us to be one with Christ. It took us death. And that's serious. No wonder... Paul says to the men in in Ephesus, love your wife as Christ loves the church. It takes a death internally. So we started there, and then we finished this week talking about a practical way that we can become one, and that is to actually labor together. Um, You know what I found is that in in life, we we do a lot of things, but we we don't actually do a lot of things that matter. All right. Uh, if you're trying to get your career to be the thing that you do to get, or one of the worst things most couples do is have the same job. Now, now that works for some people. Carrie and I would would need a permanent 
police officer probably with us if we were trying to do this to work together. I mean, we'd kill each other, right? Maybe some of y'all, I'm looking at, I'm looking at my live audience here too. I don't, I don't, some of y'all may have it all figured out, not the Rammels. I, 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 Drew, you work with your wife. I, that's, that's Oh impressive. my gosh. If, if we didn't have separate offices, we wouldn't. It wouldn't work. Together. It wouldn't yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's like a, a, he has his own marketing company, so they, they had to do it for financial reasons. <laughs> um, but but it's, there's a, so you're not going to be made one in a career path normally. Some people do, but most of us, that's not going to work. And I, I don't want you to hear my harsh statement on why. All right. Because your career and my career doesn't matter. I mean, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, some of you think that if, if you were not doing what you're doing, the world would literally come to an end. If that's the case, the world's going to come to an end because you're eventually not going to be doing what you're doing. Like, what you're doing really doesn't matter that much, including me. You're just super saying, oh, yeah, I bet you think yours matter. No, I don't. I, I really think I'm very replaceable. There are a lot of preachers in the world. The church has been around for 2,000 years. God seems to always find somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, so I'm very replaceable. And it's a good thing because I'm going to die one day or I'm going to retire and move to the beach. All right? So something's going to happen where I ain't going to be doing this anymore. So here's what we do. Here's where I'm going with this. We place all this value in our careers and we try to build a sense of unity together as we labor in things that don't matter. But when you labor in things that don't matter, it doesn't matter. That's deep right there, brother. I'm telling you right now. All right? It doesn't matter. Like, it, it, it just, it only matters a little bit, and it can develop some unity, you know what I'm saying? But, but it, but there's, eventually, it just doesn't. It, it's, it becomes a burden for you that you're trying to labor in this. Careers are burdensome. It takes a lot out of my family for me to serve this church. Like, we, we enjoy it. We do it together as much as we can. That's where I'm going to. But it's a burden. So... Paul wrote this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. It's one of my favorite scriptures. He says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, the work that you do, that's a part of what Christ is doing. Now, that work's not in vain. That work matters. What did Christ call us to do? Love one another, love him. Gage people the gospel, share the love of Christ. As we labor in things that matter, as we labor in things that truly impact others. Now listen, your job matters. You need one. If you don't have a job, get one, all right? You got to pay your bills. Paul actually wrote to one church in, in Thessalonica and said, get a job, all right? So you need a job, you need to work. That does matter, okay? That matters. Everybody shake your head if you're with me. That matters, all right? But that's not what is going to create a bond in your life because it only matters temporally. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter in the sense that if you don't work that job, there's nothing else. You can just do another one. You know what I'm saying? There's always another one out there. But the work of the Lord is irreplaceable. Like as you labor in what Christ accomplished on Calvary, I mean, just think about this. The new covenant that is in Christ alone, he has invited us to join him. Now, I don't know your kids, like, think about the things that you let your kids participate with you in and the things that you don't. You know what I mean? Like, when you're wiring up the light in your house, which I'm not allowed to do, all right? But you're wiring up the amen. light in your house. Yeah, amen, right? Yeah, all, all the church said amen. Uh, you don't ask your two-year-old, do you want to help? You know, now, they, if your two-year-old's like my kids, they want to, and they're fully confident that they're going to help you. But you're not going to ask your two-year-old to wire up a light with you because it's going to be bad, right? Now, God has asked us to labor with him in rescuing people from eternal damnation. That hurt. All right. Rescuing people from eternal damnation. Okay, so you think your light is an important job? How about your neighbor's going to die and go to hell? And Christ gave his life so that he wouldn't. And he's invited you and empowered you and gifted you and anointed you for the task of leading this person to Jesus. That's crazy. Like, I've had people trust me with stuff that I was like, you smoke crack for thinking that it's smart to trust me with that, right? God just entrusted us 
with the greatest mission ever. So just think about the impact in your marriage, all right? Think about the impact in your marriage when you start laboring together in that. Let me give you an example, all right? Let me give you an example. It has nothing to do with marriage. If you got your Bible, keep on going over to uh, Acts, all right? Actually, back to Acts, all right? Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Um, so the Apostle Paul is, is coming, he's heading to Jerusalem, and he's pretty sure when he gets to Jerusalem, it's going to go really bad, all right? And it did. We don't have time to go through the whole story. He's like, when I get to Jerusalem, they really don't like me there. <laughs> this is going to get really ugly, all right? <laughs> so he gets arrested, and this long, drawn-out process of getting flipped to one person next ends up in a Roman prison all the way back in Rome, all right? Uh, but along the way, he really does feel like that this probably is going to be it for him, and he stops by a church in Ephesus that he had planted. Now, if you go back in the book of Acts, man, it is incredible. Go, I mean, just absolutely incredible. If you go back to chapter 19, you can really see what happened in Ephesus, and Paul's preaching in there, man, he's laboring with him, man, this goes, the whole city goes nuts crazy. All right, they go nuts crazy, and they're trying to run him off. And then next thing you know, there's tradesmen who are all upset, and they want his head chopped off, you know, because these tradesmen were making uh, false gods, any god but God. And, but Paul's out there preaching that those things aren't really gods, and they're like, oh, no, yes, they are. And they're like, no, they're not, and I'll introduce you to the real God. And people start getting saved, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's just a piece of silver that this guy's making a lot of money selling me, and they stop buying it. So, you know, whenever you mess up the economy, people generally get pretty mad. So, long story short, uh, it gets crazy. Paul leaves, does a bunch of ministry other places. But he was in Ephesus for over two years doing ministry. For two years, preaching, teaching, literally putting his life on the line with these other people in Ephesus. So, as he's going to Jerusalem, he doesn't actually go back in the city, which was pretty smart because they'd have probably killed him as soon as he walked in there. But he calls the elders of the church, the people who had worked closest with them, all right, laboring in the work of the Lord, he calls the elders of the church to come out and meet them. And he's going to tell them, hey guys, we're probably not going to see one another again, but I got some stuff I want you to know, all right? So I want you to listen to the background of what's happening here, all right? Not necessarily the foreground, but listen to the background of the emotion between Paul and and these people that he had spent two years laboring together in the cause of Christ with, all right? So, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians, (laughs) uh, let's go to Acts 20, 17, all right, Acts chapter 20, what? Book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 17, all right, here we go. Now, from Miletus, he sent, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him, and when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. Where they were trying, it was most of the persecution in the the first century church was coming from Jews who were offended that Jews were preaching that Jesus was the Messiah. All right? So. So he says, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day and I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house. Okay, so verse 20. So I'm going house to house in your homes, teaching God's word in your home with you, Okay, which did what? That put your life on the line too. So you're inviting your neighbors to come hear this, this thing that the silversmith's gods that he's making are not really gods. And, the, and if you're a Jewish neighbor, hey, Jesus is the Messiah, and what you're praying for in the synagogue, it's been fulfilled. His name's Jesus, and he was crucified, and he's alive. All right, all of which offended everybody. So it's not just Paul that's putting his life on the line. It's each one of these people as he's inviting them into their home. And and notice, he's the one doing the teaching in the home. Verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city 
that imprisonment and afflictions await me. That's what I'm pretty sure is going to happen because that's been the pattern. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of grace of God. Verse 25. And now behold, I know, flip my page here, I know that none of you among whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. That's heavy. Verse 25. We're not going to see each other again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Now remember, he's talking to the pastors of the church. So he's, so he's charging them now. Pay careful attention to you yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. That is a, I mean, that's, that's, that's a harsh Harsh thing that he's saying is getting ready to happen. Wolves, when they come in, they eat everything. All right, so we're not talking about you know the scene of Dumb and Dumber where the kid's sitting there going, pretty bird, pretty bird. All right, the wolves, I guess they did rip that bird's head off, though. So that actually is a pretty good imagery all right, from that scene. So he's going, wolves are going to come in here, and they're going to try to treat you like they did the bird on Dumb and Dumber. All right? So he's, he's telling these shepherds, you got to know that, and it's your job to keep that from happening. He's charging them. So verse 31, therefore, be alert, remembering. So hear the passion in his voice for the church in Ephesus, that he's charging these pastors. These people are coming to kill them, all right, to destroy them spiritually. Therefore, verse 31, draw away the disciples. Or therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. So I was wrong earlier. I said two, it was three. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who are with me. So I was there laboring to provide for myself and, and planting this church with you. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than receive. So I sacrificed Man, I labored with you. I gave my flesh, my blood, and even my money. All right, verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that he would not see his, they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to his ship. Now, Behind that, did you hear the passion of Paul for the church? The passion of those elders for Paul. The oneness that they had. I mean, they wept over him leaving. They embraced him. I mean, the, the language here is of a deep, sincere brokenness that Paul's leaving. That doesn't happen because he led a Bible study in somebody's house. You know what I mean? There was something more than he just led a Bible study in somebody's house and taught something and left. But he literally labored with them. Everybody say, with them. With them. And it created a bond that if you're not envious of in a good way, then, then you probably really don't appreciate what it means to truly love and be loved by someone. When you see that kind of heartbreak at a departure then that tells you how awesome it was. So here, here's what I want to say to those who are listening in here. If you want to bring something of value that's going to create a sense of us in your marriage, I mean, where your spouse cries at your funeral, not over uh, regret over what you missed on, but because of a love that was lost. If you want to create that kind of marriage, then you got to have a catalyst that matters in the labors of life. Like a catalyst that stirs that in your hearts for one another. And there's nothing that is in vain or short or small about laboring together in what matters to God, in what he sent his son to die for. 
Now, it's so important, and here's where I want to end, and you start interrupting me here after this thought if you've got anything. Got some questions over there? Uh, we don't have any questions out there. Got some comments got we need some to fix? Got some comments out there. Which ones do I need to fix? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All oh. right, so, uh, but no, we'll, we'll I jump I think the that. two that are sitting up here is the ones that we need Probably. to fix. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a total joke. All right. But I'm going to leave you this, and then we can ask some questions here in our live audience. All right, it's kind of fun. Uh, and, uh, and to those of you on live. I, I, was, I did a, uh, a little seminar with a guy named Larry Osborne recently. He's, a, he's an author, a pastor in San Diego, California. He's an awesome guy. Man, it's really awesome. just, I could go on about it. Uh, got some incredible leadership books out there. I think he's written 10 or 12 different books. They're, all, they're just awesome, all right? If you're in church ministry, you should read Larry Osborne stuff. It's really cool. I might have a small man crush on this guy, all right? So, I mean, he's just, he's just that cool. He's like 60, I don't know how old you are, Larry. You're old, all right? And and, uh, and he, he just doesn't care, man. He just says what he thinks. So it says what he thinks. So anyway, um, I forgot where I was going with that. See, I told you I have a man crush about Larry. Well, Osborne. you were talking about Larry and, and how great he is. And yeah. And we were gonna right do after so- you were going to fix yourself. Yeah. And we were going to do preaching. And so anyway, I like completely <laughs> lost my train of mind. So Larry, thanks a lot. But there was something Larry said that was really awesome. All right. So but, oh, here's what it was. All right, so San Diego, I'm there. <laughs> San Diego is the, there's a Navy SEAL base there. And uh, he said something in this, this seminar I was taking with him. And he said, so often we preach to develop leaders. And he said, that's really not good for us to do. Leaders are developed through discipleship. Uh, Jesus never attempted to develop leaders in his sermons. He developed leaders by taking 12 guys around with him and teaching and growing them and doing ministry together right? Um, so the reason why that's significant is because I've been guilty in my own ministry. I will preach as if you're not some sort of Navy SEAL Christian, all right? You know what a Navy SEAL is. Like, they're the elite, elite, elite. When the Navy SEALs show up, you really need to give up, all right? Like, it's a bad idea to engage those guys. You're going to die. And they're not coming to arrest you. They're coming to kill you, all right? So uh, so you need to give up quick, all right? We expect everyone to be these Navy SEAL Christians, you know, where it's almost, like preachers, I'm guilty of this, that if you're not, you know, leading a life group and doing online seminary classes at Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, taking mission trips to preach the gospel, selling your house and living in a van down by the river, that somehow you're not making an impact for Jesus, you know what I mean? And I've been guilty of creating that culture. And so I think a lot of times, married couples think, well, what can we do that matters? You know, what can we really do that makes an impact? I mean, what am I going to do? I- I'm not a preacher. I'm not a singer. You know, in church, isn't it kind of funny if you're not a preacher or you're not a singer, all of a sudden you feel like you don't have anything to do? And what we lost is, right there in the book of Acts, there were couples who were doing nothing more than inviting Paul to come lead a Bible study at their house and inviting the people that they were taking the time as couples to get to know. You know, that sounds a little bit like what we're doing on Facebook. I think that's what we're trying to do right here, huh? Yeah. I imagine that. How about share this to your page and invite some people to hang out with you, all right? I mean, for years, I used to belittle, invite someone to church. I would belittle that down as if you're not the one opening your Bible and leading them through an in-depth study of the book of Romans, then you're failing as a follower of Jesus. Now, my goal is for you to know Romans well enough that you can sit down and teach Romans to someone. Every pastor should have that goal. We want you to, to know God in depth. Paul prayed that in the book of S. I pray you'll know the height, the width, the depth. I mean, because this is where the power of God is discovered. But no one moves from, I met Jesus last week, to Navy SEAL Christian. I mean, the disciples walked around for three years and wouldn't even understand that he was God yet. When he died on the cross, they're grieving, thinking he's dead. They didn't even remember the fact he said he was going to rise from the grave. To the point when they came and told him he's alive, they were like, really? I mean... Thomas, let me see if it's you. I mean, so I'm saying, these guys were actually with Jesus for three years, and as pastors, we expect someone to listen to our sermons and go off and be a Navy SEAL Christian. So I don't want you to hear me saying that. But think about what happens when you and your wife, or or you're a woman, you and your husband, start praying over two or three families that you can build a relationship with together. And that you're Literally praying for them. Because it's not just about you building a relationship and inviting them over to play whatever the latest cool game is to play. But you're literally praying for them 
to know and follow Jesus Christ. Maybe it's a neighbor that you know is a Christian, but they've abandoned their faith and given up on God. Or maybe it's someone who doesn't know Jesus at all. Maybe it's someone who's been going to church and they've been burned and they've lost their faith in the, in the body of Christ. Laboring in the cause of Christ for his people to abide in him. All right? So imagine if you and your wife started praying together. All right, there's one, there's one amazing thing, right? A lot, I mean, I, you think, I bet you you and your wife pray 25 times a day. Now, like, you probably beat the Muslims. Muslims five times a day. You're probably 25 times a day. Uh, you, you know what's weird for me is it's awkward for me praying with my wife. Isn't that odd? A lot, I mean, a lot of men. I pray with people all day long. I mean, I do that, and it's never odd. But there's, there's, it's took, a tw- it's took 21 years. It's not odd anymore. You know, but 21 years before it was like, okay, I pray with my wife. Like, I don't mean to be crude, but you get naked with your spouse, all right? But it's awkward to say, dear Lord, all right, what is up with that? All right, I, that, was, that was PG, wasn't it? Like, I mean, everybody knows that. It's hard to play with somebody who knows everything about you. Yeah, I think that, like, I think that has a lot all, to do with All it. your innermost terrible things. Yeah, yeah, and I just said naked. Yeah. So there it is, all right? So... Uh, <laughs> But it wouldn't be venture without that. Yeah, no, I got to throw something in there. Uh, it's it's part of the course, right? So I've been doing this for years. Um, but just so just think about this. Imagine you and your spouse start praying together, and you're not praying about so and so, it's flu bug or whatever. But you're praying specifically for some of the people that you've decided. Okay, as a couple, we're going to really try and reach these particular people. Maybe it's some folks at work. Maybe it's some parents of some of your kids that you're getting to know at the ballpark or whatever it might be. Maybe it's some neighbors. I don't know. But you start going, here's the three, the four, the five, whoever it might be. Amy Kelly, not 50. All right? So I love Amy. She's going to change the whole world, you know? I got it. Yeah. Amy's going to reach everyone in charitable. She probably is praying for you by name. I bet she's found a phone book somewhere. All right? So th- th- she's like, good idea. I'm going to start doing that. All right? So, but, but just imagine if you started circling these people and said, we're going to pray for these people. And then you started trying to figure out ways to just actually know those people together as a couple. Come over to the house, eat, let's go out to eat, let's go whatever. I was going to say go to the movies. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you start figuring out ways to get to know them. And then you do this like crazy wild thing, all right? You're like, hey, why don't we go to eat lunch on Sunday? But let's start off. We'd love for you guys to go hang out with us at church. Now, in my past, I would belittle that as, no, it's just weak. You know, you, you're so weak. That's not weak at all. That's what was happening right here in Acts. This is where this relationship was built between Paul and these people as he labored with them in their homes. Paul wasn't expecting every one of them to be life group leaders. Paul wasn't expecting every one of them to be teachers. He expected some of them because there's a group of men who've gone to this town to meet with him that came up out of Ephesus. So again, we're not knocking leadership and growing leaders and seeing that. That's big. But every follower of Christ can labor with Jesus in the cause of Christ. So for you and your spouse, imagine that's where you started. That's our first check. Maybe you decide to move a little bit further. Maybe you want to get plugged into to the church together and start volunteering in our youth ministry. I mean, that'd be awesome. Again, you don't have to be a theological major to volunteer in student ministry together. Husband, wife, come up here, hang out. There's all kinds of things you can do to build relationships with students and impact students. Same thing in our children's ministry. There's certain people who teach the preschoolers. Lord bless you. You're amazing. I slipped in there this week. <laughs> I was like, Been Chris, there and done that. Yeah, yeah, you did that for a long time, dude. I went in, bro, I went into the preschool, right? We don't have K through 5 now, all right? You did preschool for a while, too, though, didn't you? Just for a very little while. We found out that, that preschool is a whole different uh, group of animals. I'm going to tell K-5. you what. If you want to meet somebody who's anointed with the power of God, go find somebody who teaches preschoolers. I walked in there. I was like, Chris was preaching. I slipped into preschool. I, walked, I was like three minutes. I was like, I'm out. I'm good. I can't take it, man. I was like, ah, I'm going crazy. All right, so, but you ain't got to be able to teach a preschooler. You can just hang out with a, the cool thing about preschoolers is, man, anybody can play with a preschooler. You just got to act stupid, and they just think it's great, you know, and you go, well, how is that really impacting? Here, just check this out again. Last little commercial on this. Uh, let's take the nursery, for instance. Let's say you go, you know what, honey? Let's, let's labor together in the kingdom of God volunteer to work in the nursery adventure. You go, how is that impacting somebody? Well, get this. The average person who comes to venture went to church as a kid and has never been back. That's the average person. I joke at venture that if I say turn to John, half the church looks down the row to figure out who John is and which person they need to be looking at. They don't know John's book in the Bible yet. So mama 
shows up to church. Somebody at Venture has been praying for their neighbor. They invited that neighbor to come. And she shows up with her eight-month-old baby. Screaming, crying, pooping, hollering, right? And she wants to come in with these new friends that go to Venture that have invited her and are going to take her to Sammy's after lunch, after, ser- after the service, all right? Or, or excuse me, Long Creek. Or, I better not do that. I certainly mentioned the restaurants and they're not just getting in trouble, all right? Uh, so, some uh, good restaurants showing up in Dallas. It is? We got some good ones, man. I'll try them out. So, so all of a sudden, she checks her baby in. She shows up at the nursery, opens the door, and literally all hell is breaking loose in there because there's one sweet little lady in there taking care of a 25 baby. Now, do you think for a second that that mom is going to leave that baby in there? No. Now she's sitting in worship service with a baby crawling all over top of her, screaming, pooping in the diaper, right, going crazy, and she's not hearing the gospel. She's not getting the message in the song. She's just wondering, when can I get out of this place because this baby's driving me crazy, and I feel like everybody in all tours looking at me because my baby's screaming, all right? So imagine how amazing of a ministry it is when... Someone decides, hey, honey, let's volunteer once a month in the nursery. So that when mama opens the door, it doesn't literally look like Satan and his demons have turned loose inside of a room. But she opens the door, and there's a smiling face. because I'm so glad you're here today. What's your baby's name? I can't wait to get to hang out. Think of that in the preschool. So glad you're here today. I can't teach your kid because that'll make me crazy. But I'm going to eat some Cheetos with your kid, and we're going to have a good time. <laughs> and this is going to be a safe environment. When you come back, we're going to give them back to you just like you left them. You see, those, those things we have so often, I know I have, overlooked. But as you begin to do those as couples, I know Drew and his wife for years served in a kids' ministry. Uh, Joe Padilla and his wife, Stephanie, years hanging out in the preschool. They, they really know Jesus. I just think of so many of Chris and B. Mintz started doing ministry here just hanging out with students. Now, Chris actually runs a student ministry. I go on and on and on and on about couples that got plugged in together and began to labor together, and, I, and then watched that work begin to gel them together. So whether it's serving somewhere in the church, or don't let that supplement praying for neighbors. Man, there's nothing bigger that you can do than praying for those relationships you have in common. Man, if you never served a day in this ministry whatsoever, because you didn't have time, because you were so invested in your neighbors, great. I would rather have to hire a daycare worker to come over here from somewhere than to break you off of that relationship with that neighbor, all right? Because that's number one. But just imagine, as a husband and wife, you begin to think that way and talk that way and pray that way with one another. It's going to force you into biblical conversations. We want to see them come to know Christ. What does that even mean? We're praying for them. How should we pray for them? See, every question you'll ask in that effort is going to take you right back to God's Word, and you get to study it together. And that labor is not in vain. That labor matters. And it will produce a oneness in your marriage like no other. All right. Hey, I think, I don't even know what kind of time limit we have. And I'm guessing we got like, some, we Jesus got some always works here. in an hour, I guess. So we'll, we'll do it in an hour. We got some comments here if you want to hear All them. right, let it roll. Let it roll. Okay, so. Um, and, then so we, and then we'll come out here and see what you guys got some questions coming. So, so uh, we want to give a shout out to our friend Tasha Owens. Tasha. Washington. What's up, bro? Uh, and, right. uh, and she says, wow, way to go with inclusivity of the deaf and hard of hearing community. Uh, I love how you have always gone above and beyond to accommodate for individuals with special needs. By the way, this is being broadcast uh, on our YouTube channel, on our Deaf Ministry channel, on our Facebook, and on your personal Facebook. Yeah. So, you know, wherever you're watching, um, share it with your friends out there. Yeah. Yeah, so we might not know we actually have a Deaf uh, YouTube channel. So what we're doing now, the 930 service is going to be broadcasting live each week on, on YouTube, Facebook, and all that stuff. But then the 11 broadcasts to our deaf YouTube channel. And there's, there's, a, there's a pretty cool little momentum in that. It's really awesome. What else we got? Okay, so um, uh, Tracy Estelle is watching from South Gastonia. What up, Tracy? So he says, hey, man. Hey, Tracy, I missed Veterans Day this year. And I totally normally make a comment. And you're one of the ones I thought about. I want to thank you for your service and the veterans that are out there. Normally on Sundays, that I do that. And so, Tracy, I appreciate your service, man. It's awesome. Yeah, you know, right now we can comment on, and thank you, Caleb, for just bringing me a power cord so my computer doesn't die while we're doing yeah. this. Um, that's probably important. Yeah, because I interrupted you and I didn't find out what we're, what we're talking about. Hey, well, okay. before you go, did, I inter- did Tracy have a comment? We- oh, he just said, hey, and amen, oh. and truth, and yeah, awesome cool. stuff like that. Um, let's see, um, 
Let's jump out here real quick. Okay, let's jump out. Anybody out here got comments to say? We, we do have Jonathan, a lot. Live... just make sure if you ask me a question, I can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I like to pick on Jonathan. He's the smartest guy on staff. Anything? Or if you think so, wait, all right, hey, we got a yeah. question. Uh huh. Mm. All right. Let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna repeat your question. So, because we didn't mic the audience. That's so a she great said, question. We are awesome question. So we've done this whole series is really centered around people who are already married. But what about those who are single? In the context of dating, we know that the Bible is very clear about abstinence, sexual abstinence till marriage. Uh, but what, what else can we do? We've had some, I know Kristen had some really good conversations with our high school and middle school students, but their conversations we really need to have beyond that. And so um, I'll just, let me share my personal conviction where I got to. And just reading the Bible, understanding how do I live my life in a way that glorifies God, that guards my heart, and that gives me clear vision into, is this someone that I really want to marry? Or is this someone that I really just am attracted to sexually, right? And that's really hard to determine the difference in dating. And so uh, I was struggling with that. I was committed to abstinence, and by the grace of God, was able to do that. But it was still a tremendous struggle because what would happen is the relationship would still get physical. Now, it, it wouldn't get sexual in the sense of the worldly definition of it, but it got physical. And the moment it got physical, I didn't know what I thought about this person. And so I finally had to get to the place where I was like, okay, look, there's no way that I'm ever really going to know that I want to be with this human being the rest of my life if I allow this to get physical. Because the moment it gets physical, I want to be with them. Let's get Physical, physical, right, all right, so that's what would become the driving force of, I'm going to get on the plane to go fly and see this person, that, you know, or car, or wherever it might be, and so, so I think what, I, the number one thing I want to challenge people who are dating is be committed to not bring physicality into the relationship, like, treat this person as your sister or brother in Christ. And there's things called holy kiss, and I think we know the difference, <laughs> right? So treat them as a brother and sister in Christ. Treat them as your brother or sister. And what I found was every time I stay committed to that conviction, when those relationships became clear that this is not someone I'm supposed to marry, they ended great every time, uh, I'm married now, so I don't prioritize the relationships. But the irony is my wife is friends with some of the girls that I thought I was going to marry. You know, it was all head over heels in love with. My wife actually communicates with, the, with some of those that I treated that way. Now, I don't communicate because I, you know, that's obvious. You know, that's a whole other sermon. That right would there. not go yeah. good, you know. <laughs> but, but she can look at them and there's no there's no like awkwardness, you know what I mean? Like I never treated them any differently than I treated my sister. And so uh, the, the, that's a hard thing because there were some heavy heartbreaks in that. I remember some of the most brutal heartbreak of my life was feeling the person that I had become very good friends with was the person I wanted to marry. And they looked at me and said, you're the best brother I've ever had. <laughs> right? You ever got that one? I really look at you like a brother. You know, and every guy knows that one, what that means. That means you're done. You know, so you're, you're done. That's zone. it. And uh, that was hard because I was committed to be a friend, and now I want more than a friendship, and they don't. And that was brutal. I mean, I don't know that I've ever experienced heartbreak that hard, but it was worth it. And so what I would advise those of you who are single, just my advice, uh, you know, it's hard to look at the New Testament and understand dating because it didn't exist in the first century as we know it. Uh, but we can look at the New Testament and understand holiness and love. We can understand friendship and unity. And we can see wisdom in the Proverbs. And the wisdom of the Proverbs would teach us, I think, that direction. Now, I've heard people say, well, how do you know if you're really attracted to them? I'm like, really? <laughs> like, that could be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. How do you know that you're going to click together physically? Once again, 
That's kind of ridiculous. All right, so uh, uh, Carrie and I, no physical relationship whatsoever until we, until we got engaged. And the first time I kissed her, I was like, that may have been a mistake. <laughs> like, mm, let's see, we're talking about getting married in a year. Can we do it tomorrow? <laughs> you know, so like, uh, and we had never had any physical contact outside of brother-sister hug. You know what I mean? So, um, so I, there, I think that's just the world pressing in and trying to justify immorality. Um, and so I'm, I'm not preaching this as, you know, if you don't do this, you're in sin. I'm just giving that as my advice. And I'm really glad how that went. So. There you go. Talking to Mike because oh, nobody cool. can hear you. Yeah. Um, I, I, you were talking about serving together in marriage. And a lot of times we think of dating in, in like an entertainment context. Like yes. what can we do to entertain ourselves together? Love where you're going. Uh, yep. But what you're saying is you need to get to know that person as a person you know, who they are spiritually. Yes. And I don't think there's any better way to do that than, than maybe to serve together in some form or fashion if it's somebody you're thinking about marrying. Yeah, if you're, if you're a Christian, there's nothing. Now, I, it was interesting in college, I had a professor at Liberty University say, if you're dating a girl, don't pray with her. They said there's nothing that will tempt you sexually more than praying together. Now, that's good advice for some of y'all are married. Maybe the reason why the marriage is cold physically is because it's cold spiritually. Watch what happens when it gets warm spiritually. Anyway, all right, so I don't know who's listening. <laughs> I'll keep it PG, man. I'm keeping it PG. Um, but in your dating relationships, imagine you're act, actually out there serving together in a church, going to Bible studies together, being a part of a life group together. The context of your relationship not being let's go to the movies or a football game or hang out at mom's house the context of your relationship being within the body of Christ and church and participating in those things, what, number one, a safe environment of accountability. Number two, wisdom. You got other people around you that can look at you and say, hey man, I know you guys are all about this relationship, but there's some red flags y'all need to be paying attention to. Uh, And I had some people who threw some red flags up on some of my relationships, and I'm grateful. I won't name which ones in case they're listening to the live stream. Uh, but um, it's I, I, good think, to have I think John is dead right. Yep. It's always good to have good neighbors. Yes. They, they see things you don't. Correct. So, hey, a couple more shout outs real quick. Um, yeah. And, and we did have one question here online that's uh-huh. really, really important. So, um, so uh, hey, Sarah Ferry here in Gloucester, Virginia is watching uh, with Sa- her family. Sarah. Is that not hilarious how he just pronounced it? I, it's, it's Gloucester. Oh. Yeah, but we, we forgive everybody who's not from Virginia. They have no idea how to say it. That's yeah. all right. Like Norfolk. I'm like, ah, we all laugh. It's not Norfolk. You know, Pequowson. It's Pequowson. Anyway, yeah, ahead. but I know, how Sarah, to say, I know how to say Cherville. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I have no <laughs> idea. I know how to say Sundrop. So, uh, Sarah, glad you're with us. It's awesome. All right. And, um, hey, we have a question here. Um, you know, where can I go if I need to get counseling? That is a, that, awesome. And assuming you're here in Gaston County, mm-hmm. um, if you go to our church website, we've, we're linked up on this as well. Well, we posted these in the chat too, so. Okay, yeah. Look down in the chat and you'll see a, we, we primarily recommend three counselors. Uh, Kim Talbert Kirk, who's on staff here, and you can't beat her rate. Uh, David Mean, who has a, uh, it's called Coldwater Counseling, that's in Gastonia. And we also do a lot with, um, I always want to call them so. Rogers Rogers. Christian Counseling, and uh, we've had just seen God do some incredible things through through that counseling ministry. But also, we partnered up with a bunch of churches around Gaston County um, and invested tens of thousands of dollars, and we got a grant into that as well. Um, And to access that, I just went completely brain dead. If you go to uh, someonelisten.com. There we go. Someonelisten.com. And there is a list of counselors uh, also on Gas and COVID. um, Remember that you made the website? Yeah, it's on that. Oh, yeah. I I did. I almost forgot You made that website. All right. So (laughs) GastonCOVID.com, we put a list of counselors that are recommended from from the like-minded clergy that, that we as a church work with. And so there's a lot more than just the ones that we recommend. But also, if you go to the website he just mentioned, they'll not only connect you with one of those counselors, all right, that, that we as pastors around Gaston County have said, yeah, we've, got, we've had good success with these folks. Um, they'll also help you pay for it. And so if you're in a financial situation where you're going, man, we really need counseling, uh, but we can't afford it, we want to get that off the table for you. So go to someone, someonelisten.com. Someonelisten.com. Ray, don't, 
beat me for forgetting the name of that. Ray Hardy came up with the name. Uh, and, and that can help you there. That's, that's really awesome. Yeah. So, Back in the audience, anybody? Now that we got a mic out, you know, don't let it freeze you up. Anybody else? Well, hey, we're going to wrap this up. It's 8 o'clock. And yep. did, was there one more that we needed to hit? Because otherwise I'm going to wrap it up. Um, no, I just wanted to say, hey, well, we're planning on being back here live again Wednesday night. Yep. Uh, next Wednesday. So if you enjoy this format, let us know about it. You can still comment mm -hmm. um, on any of those channels. And we do go back and read those comments later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you've got any questions or anything like that. Or if you've got a question that you didn't want put out there in public, you can go to daretoventure.org and click on the next step button and, uh, and ask your question privately and connect with a, with a pastor here, um, and they will get back with you. That sounds awesome. So, hey, man, thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward. We're going to try this out and see how it goes. And so we're committed to it now for, for a while. And uh, it'll be 7 to 8 o'clock on Wednesday night. And uh, feel free, as he said, email us things in advance. Uh, the key to make this really work well for you, all right, if this is the only time you can join us, don't worry about it. But if you want to maximize this opportunity, then be sure to either be in one of our worship gatherings on Sunday at 9, 30, 11, or join us on live stream. And if you miss it on Sunday, don't worry about it. It's still posted on Facebook and YouTube. And so if you can watch the sermon before our Bible study, this is going to be a really cool follow-up. It's going to bring out other things. And again, if you can't watch it, no big deal. Uh, we'll, we'll make it where this will be just as meaningful to you without it, but it'll just be more if you also have that sermon. So I hope to get to see you in person one Sunday if you're online. I understand a lot of you watch online just because you have to or just whatever, but, uh, or maybe you're just trying to check things out. And we're just so glad you're with us. We want you to know you're a part of us, and anything we can do for you, please let us know. And it's so good to see all of you guys here in person, and I'm looking forward to this, uh, like I said, and I know you, all you are here on Sundays normally, so it's so good to see you. And let's pray. God, thank you for an opportunity to get together to study your word. Uh, God, for those who are single, oh, uh, Lord, there's some folks that are in, they're single and, and they don't want to be single. And there's some folks that are single and they're really happy about being single right now. Uh, Lord, in either situation, I just, I just pray your spirit would work and move. That you'd build confidence and clarity. And Lord, if you're calling them into a marriage, God, that they would have the wisdom to listen to your call. To make steps in a direction that help them know the direction you're calling them to. Because Lord, I believe if you've called us to be married, then you've called someone to be married to us. And so Lord, give them the faith to be able to wait on you. And the faith to move forward when it is you. God, for those of us that are married, Lord, we just... Uh, Satan is coming to steal, kill, and destroy the joy of living as one in marriage. Uh, Lord, give us wisdom to seek you so that we can be one with one another. Lord, I just pray that you would do such a work in our marriages that the lost world around us would turn their heads and want to know how in the world can a man and a woman know one another with such joy and depth. And Lord, when they ask that question, I pray they'll find you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you again.